On Thursday, April 20th at 8.33 in the morning, Booster 7's Raptors roared to life, lifting itself and Ship 24 into the Texas sky. This first flight of an integrated Starship and Super Heavy lasted about four minutes. With the booster losing engines and both hydraulic power units and eventually tumbling through the sky, the flight termination system was activated. While the Starship failed to reach space on its first attempt, the flight plan called for both vehicles to be expended, making it understandable that SpaceX seems to be quite happy with the results and the wealth of data that it gave them. However, what seems to not have been quite anticipated was the cost the launch would exact upon Stage Zero and the rest of the launch complex. As Booster 7's Raptors throttled up for liftoff, the most powerful rocket plume in history utterly destroyed the heavy-duty concrete called Fondag underneath the launch mount. As the Fondag began to crack, the vehicle's exhaust found those cracks, which caused pressure to build up below the concrete, which caused more cracks and more pressure in a vicious cycle, with the end result being an explosion of the concrete pad, sending debris in all directions and leaving a deep crater behind. Rover 2, located across the street from the suborbital tank farm, caught the chaos as projectiles blew out from the launch site. A roughly bowling ball sized chunk of concrete shooting over the container wall at over 300 miles per hour tore into the back of NASA Space Flight's camera van, dealing it heavy structural damage. Most of the cameras set up by the various credentialed photographers were similarly taken out by either debris or the force of the pressure wave from the rocket. Some sheets of sheet metal scattered around the area ripped off of pieces from Starhopper skin. The sturdy vehicle turned water tank, however, does appear to have been spared from significant structural damage. Just inside the launch site itself, pictures from after the launch show extensive damage to the concrete container wall behind Hoppy as well as the pseudo container wall on the other side of the main gate. It was already apparent that there was significant damage to the vertical tanks at the orbital tank farm. All four of the tanks closest to the launch mount took multiple hits from debris and pressure waves. The westernmost tank, which was designed as a methane tank and later converted into a water tank, never received perlite insulation. The next tank in to the right was the original water tank and is now likely just an empty shell. The void between the external skins of these two tanks may explain why the dents are so much more pronounced on them. However, the two LOX tanks on the eastern side still each took several hard hits, with the easternmost tank appearing to have taken a hit likely from a piece of rebar and on. That penetrated not just the outer skin, but the perlite layer and the inner tank as well. Small puffs of gas escaping could be seen coming from the hole for the better part of a day. On top of the tank farm's fluid bunker, very large chunks of concrete could be seen laying partially on top of the high-pressure gas canisters that are stored there. Luckily, there is no evidence that these containers failed, which could have caused additional damage to the surrounding infrastructure. It will be very interesting to see what approach SpaceX takes to this tank farm in the coming months as Elon has stated that building the tanks themselves rather than just buying commercially available ones was a mistake. Over at the launch tower, the shielding on the lower levels seemed to have taken many hits, but accomplished the mission of protecting the equipment inside the tower. The metal sheet next to the drawworks hoist, however, appears to have been much too thin to stand up to the onslaught of concrete and rebar projectiles as the ground photos show it, looking even less like metal and more like a tarp full of holes. Fortunately though, on Monday, the chopsticks were finally lowered back to the base of the tower, indicating that the hoist still maintains at least some functionality and hopefully escaped major damage. The chopsticks and the quick disconnect arm look like they have escaped anything more than superficial damage, likely as a result of their height being subjected to less debris. Perhaps the most significant damage of all though, can be seen underneath the orbital launch mount. Not only did the booster excavate a huge crater through the fondag and dirt directly beneath the booster, but there were very large slabs of concrete missing from the area immediately surrounding the mount. Crucially, there's also very serious damage to the concrete foundations that support the mount itself. Stepping back for a minute, the big questions on everyone's mind are what happened and where do they go from here? According to tweets from Elon, SpaceX knew the Fondag was not going to be strong enough for their needs and were already working on a water-cooled plate that will go underneath the launch mount in the future. Unfortunately, Based on the 31-inch static fire test, SpaceX still overestimated the Fondag and thought it would still stand up to a single launch. In conclusion, SpaceX promised excitement, and they delivered. Seeing the largest and most powerful rocket in history take to the skies is something we will never forget. While it is true that the recovery efforts for Stage Zero are likely to be extensive and expensive, 
they will end up with a more robust Stage Zero that will hopefully hold up to the stresses of the next launch and many more to follow. Also, while teams work to rebuild, behind the scenes, teams will be not only poring over all the data they were able to reap from this test, but also work to implement design changes based on this new information. This week, two days after the exciting debut launch of Starship and Super Heavy, photojournalists were allowed to return to the launch site to retrieve their equipment from the grounds outside the launch pad. The following day, SpaceX's personnel began in-depth inspections of the launch infrastructure, such as the tower and orbital launch mount, which bore the fury of the 30 Raptor 2 engines. By Monday night, crews arriving on boom lifts began the work of repairing the orbital launch mount and other pad infrastructure in earnest. SpaceX estimates they'll have the pad and vehicles ready for the next launch attempt in about two months. Over at the high bay, the new two-point shift lifting jig was put up to use on Ship 28, lifting and repositioning the vehicle inside. This new rig uses the same lifting points that the chopsticks do, allowing SpaceX to cover the overhead crane lifting points on top of the nose cone with tiles. Late on Wednesday evening, a concrete pump truck arrived at the build site to pour the north and western side of the new Megabay Foundation, which is located west of the ring yard. Shortly after that, an unknown metal structure, which might be a protective hood for a welding robot, was removed from the high bay with the Tando crawler crane. Overnight into Thursday, a boom extension was added to SpaceX's Grove GMK 7550 telescopic boom crane, giving it enough lifting height to reach the top of the ship quick disconnect on the launch tower. After continuously pouring concrete through most of the night and into the morning, the concrete pump truck completed its 12-hour pour of the new Mega Bay Foundation at the build site. Highlighted here on RGV's flyer image from the previous day, you can see where the concrete was poured. In addition, you can spot another pour covering the electrical conduit below marked with red dye. Late that evening, a large fire broke out at the Massey's testing site. The cause of the fire is not yet known at this time, but several pieces of equipment including generators, powered light fixtures, a scissor lift, and a teller handler were charred in the blaze. Sometime between the 26th and the 28th, nose cone 31 was tested to its limits in a Max-Q structural stress test until it crumpled, similar to its predecessor nose cone 12 tested two years ago in the same test rig. At the launch site, the functionality of the booster quick disconnect was checked repeatedly, opening and closing several times to make sure it's in working order. Over at the Cape, inclement weather has been the order of the week, forcing several scrubs. On Thursday, Falcon 9 Booster 1069 was relocated to Slick 40. With the successful completion of the Starlink Group 6-2 and safe return to the Port Canaveral docks, Falcon 9 Booster 1073 was lowered onto the horizontal transporter for refurbishment at Roberts Road. SpaceX recovery ship Bob headed out to sea to support the launch of Falcon 9 O3B, Empower 3 and 4, which launched on Friday from Space Launch Complex 40.